All right. So, thank you for the opportunity to hang on just a minute. Uh, come along and talk to you today and share uh, what we at Two Degrees did to de risk our implementation and reduce the cost of ownership post go live. Now, about two and a half years ago, I was in the position that maybe some of you are here today in, when we were wondering how the heck we were going to manage the testing of this new ERP system that we were looking to deploy into the business. Now, during my discovery on what it takes to support this type of implementation, I spoke to a number of external organisations who had already been on the journey. Thanks, Vimal. <laughs> um, they generously shared their learnings with me, some of which I'll pass on to you, and uh, along with the uh, learnings that we gained from our implementation, Shakai will pass on to you. Now, by having early access to this information, it enabled us to better de-risk and better plan and prepare for our test activity. And as a result, we were well recognised within the programme and right up to the executive level as having testing, having had it together. Now, I'm hoping that by sharing these learnings and our experiences with you, you can take it away, build upon it, and it would be a bit of pay it forward, if you will. Right. So, some background. Uh, step, to uh, step back in time a bit and give you a bit of context. I started at Two Degrees in January of 2020, and by that stage, uh, the program to introduce D365 had been in play for more than seven months. We'd made the decision to implement. Oh, sorry. We'd made the decision to implement D365, and our service integrator was Intigen, now known as Capgemini. We had three modules: finance, supply chain, and projects. And of course, we had three source systems, and therefore there was a migration involved. Now, in terms of integration points, we had a number of integration points, but we automated two of them before go live. And in terms of our customization, um, our customization level was less than 10%, but it was just about double the best practice recommendation of 5%. Now, we spoke to our integrator, and if you had to assign a complexity rating, we would come about, and compared to other ones, medium complexity. Now, um, my immediate experience of ERP post, uh, systems post go live was varied. Uh, just come from Vodafone, we had a global install of SAP. And every year we had two to three patches that were deployed and required a lot of support from both testing and the business. Um, prior to that, I'd worked at Telstra Clear and testing had nothing to do with it. So it was purely between finance and the uh, integrator. So I became aware early on in my involvement with the D365 program that there was a regular cadence of changes. And at that stage, I wasn't too sure what testing's involvement would be. So <clears throat> I assumed that we would be involved, but uh, I needed to find out to what extent. Right, so I had some key considerations um, when I was thinking about how to approach this and um, how we would support it post go live. Now. It's been done before. What could we learn from um, implementations from organ other organisations? The other thing is we're telco testers, we're not finance testers. Um, how, there were people out in the marketplace who had done this type of testing before, how could we leverage that? And most importantly, because it was my cost centre, um, cost of ownership, how cheap could we make it? I like the birdies. <laughs> anyway, my initial indications, uh, estimations of how much um, we were looking at spending was north of 300k uh, for the um, cost of supporting the updates once we went live and felt that was pretty unacceptable. <clears throat> so, it's been done before looking at my first consideration. So, I reached out to our service integrator and Assurity and asked for some introductions to some previous clients who had gone through the implementation. I came, I came away with three contacts, a large government organisation. They actually implemented Oracle financials, but there were still some learnings to be had there. Um, a large entertainment corporate and a large multi-agency cooperative. Now, both the last two had D365 implementations. Now, at the end of the day, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I would far prefer to build upon what was already available in terms of information and perfect it. Um, my, my, my learnings were as follows, that um, BAU support was heavy touch. It seemed that a, a number of organisations had undercooked how much support was required post-go-live. 
One organisation had three to four testers continuously testing each update with two deployments into production a year. I like the concept though of testing each patch. One of the organisations was manually running the same 700 test cases that they'd used during their implementation and um, on each of the update cycles. Nobody had reviewed the test cases and distilled them down to a, a discrete regression pack. <laughs> no bad, eh? um, so also D365 testing was pretty repetitive and testers didn't enjoy it and it was something to avoid at all costs. Other learnings included uh, post go live the focus tended to be on embedding and refining the deliverable. Nobody was looking at continuous improvement. In fact one of the organisations was actively reversing out the custom code to align with out of the box functionality. Neither of the two D365 implementations went live with the test automation in place to fully support update testing. Although when I caught up with them, they do, both of them had plans to set it, put it into place. Now one of the organisations I talked to had a stretch target to reduce their testing to one week three testers. So I quite like that one too, so I keep that one in my back pocket. Now, right, so thinking back to my second consideration that we are telco testers, not finance testers. That is not to say that we couldn't do it. We could, but why train up a bunch of testers on um, D365 when the testers out there that, with the skills already and the learnings that we could leverage? So I decided to go out to RFP with a number of a local test suppliers who had had experience in this area. Now, I eventually selected a surety. They weren't the cheapest but I had worked with them for a number of years and I had a high degree of trust in the quality of the resources and the value that they could provide. Let's face it, we had a little thing called 5G last year in the test environment, so between, just to give you a bit of an idea, between 5G and um, this program of work, we had 30 testers, plus we had all our BAU, I think we were up to about 80 testers at one stage, which for us was quite large. Um, in terms of growing internal IP, I also chose to embed one of our own testers in the program. Didn't quite go according to plan. D365 test skills are quite marketable. She left halfway through the program and went contracting. So um, you might want to consider that as part of your resource strategy. Right, cost of ownership, how cheap could we make it? I mean, the answer to this is pretty obvious, right? It's test automation, test automation, test automation. So after talking to the three organisations, I revisited our uh, automation plans and requested that the programme include a deliverable to, fully automa uh, to deliver a fully automated regression pack. Now, the internal supporting update process also needed to be defined. I was looking for a cookie cutter approach that we could roll out for each release, right? And I requested that that be tested, or defined and tested within the course of the program with the regression pack. And that had to be done before go live. I also decided that like one of the organisations I met with, that I wanted to test the updates as they came out, and test and automation would ensure that that would be low cost, low impact. As I said, it was obvious, and it's always hard to put it into place, but um, we just made, needed to make it happen. So with all this decided, Assurity entered the program, and this is where I hand over to the lovely Shakur. Thank you, Tony, and good morning, everybody. So as we know, testing in its nature is indeed risking um, a product by ensuring a level of quality as it enters production. So this level of quality is usually achieved by meeting our test exit criteria. So since we're talking about how we de-risk an ERP implementation throughout our delivery, I'll touch on five things that helped us do so. So each client's processes and approach to delivery is different. So it's important for us to understand and align with our client's delivery approach, be that waterfall, agile, hybrid, other. So we at Assurity want to come in and add immediate value to your delivery and allow you to leverage our experience in these types of implementations whilst not being an unnecessary blocker or bottleneck to progress. As Tony alluded to, we needed to manage our uh, test resourcing to maximize productivity as we experienced the peaks and troughs of delivery. Large programs of work involve numerous stakeholders with differing levels of project experience, all of whom need to be kept informed. So we needed to make testing visible. And we needed to take the business on the test journey, especially our subject matter experts, 
who have very little pr uh, project delivery experience, let alone software test experience. So we went about an education process to help them understand how they need to contribute. And we needed a way to deliver test automation that will work for this implementation and, implementation and post go live. So into the test team. This is us looking very pink. So uh, we joined the Two Degrees project team in October 2020, uh, and there were three of us to start. Uh, two test leads who had experience in D365 finance and data migration, as well as myself, the test manager, who was experienced at that time in D365 CRM implementations. So full disclosure, this was my first finance implementation. So at the time we joined, the program was in its design phase. Early configuration build activities had commenced. And our immediate goals were to assess the landscape for test, understand the risk profile, come up with high-level um, estimates, and agree a suitable test strategy with Tony, all of which is pretty standard stuff when we kick off a large implementation. So one of my very first interactions with the then program manager highlighted that this delivery plan was very, very fluid. There was a lot of discovery taking place at the time we joined the program and continuously throughout. So as you would all realize from your own experience, that what you know and plan for at the beginning of, of, an, of a program or project is highly unlikely where you'll end up. And you need to be set up to accommodate change. And one of the most important observations for us was that we were beginning this delivery with the agreement that the program will require ongoing replanning as we progress through the implementation. So for example, at the time we joined, detail level requirements were still being workshopped. And these were not expected to be finalized until after the first release into test. There was a lot to uncover. And knowing that the inevitable inclusion of CRs as the program progressed and the impacts those would have, I knew we were in for a fun ride. And we needed to be able to react quickly and adapt to a changing program landscape. So this is one of our later, more defined high-level test schedules. And this image shows the difference between what we originally planned for, which is in green, and the additional planning that we did as we progressed over the months, which is in blue. So as you can see on that, for example, if, if you look at data migration, which is really small, but we originally planned for three runs of that, and we eventually did six runs of that, just as an example. So my recommend, recommendation is to be prepared for change. Flex as the change requires and ensure that you have the financials in place to support it. Our first plan indicated a nine month test window and as we progressed, discovered, uncovered, confirmed all of our requirements and finalized, our test window eventuated to 18 months. So by continuously updating plans and forecasts, we were able to see the workload peaks and troughs approaching and we could contract and flex our people accordingly, which takes me to resource management. So, an implementation like this is like renovating your kitchen and working on multiple uh, components at once. So you will want to uh, do the cupboard build, the appliance installation, the plumbing wastewater in integration, and the tiling. So you're going to need a large team of tradies with the right tools, the right skills, and at the right times. So by continually updating our plans and forecasts, I had sufficient information to understand communicate our supporting resource requirements, and prepare testers with the relevant skills for onboarding. And during 2021, especially due to market conditions, we had quite a lot of movement in our test team, and with the impact of COVID, sickness resource planning became especially important in helping mitigate these impacts. So I'd like to take out this opportunity to point out, whilst we're looking at this resource profile, that we released resources earlier than I would typically expect on a program of this scale, and this was due largely to our automation regression uh, build that was uh, happening in parallel. So we peaked at 15 testers uh, during August and that ramped down significantly uh, with us at four on go live day. So to ensure we're on track and keep key stakeholders informed, i.e. no surprises, we needed to be as transparent as possible and it was important for our, that our business and project stakeholders had full visibility of any impacts to testing at all times. So this is us working on a, on a, on a board to define our detailed, or our high level test scenarios for our supply chain processes before we had the detailed requirements set up. So we used this to validate that we were on the right track with the business and we had this visible uh, 
So moving on to some of the things that I started doing, and one of the first things I started doing was weekly preparation reporting during test analysis and design phases. And for these ERP implementations, the test analysis and design phase is quite a lengthy process. So it's important that we have an update on this regularly. Um, it allowed me to show the magnitude of the test effort and exactly where issues reside at a glance. And it gives stakeholders an early indication of what test scenarios are being prepared and shows the growth of the test scope as we, as decisions are made. Our daily status reporting during execution provided a view of the current state of quality, as well as how far off we were from our key exit criteria of a 90% pass rate. And then the financial reporting that I did for Tony and the program management team helped us understand how we're tracking against the planned budget, and I'm happy to say we were on target for that. And in addition to what you see on the screen, our physical and digital Kanban boards, open defect triage meetings, business stand-ups, and several other ceremonies all contributed to making our testing visible to the wider product, pro project team. And then moving on to taking our business on the test journey. And, and our business, are, well, the business are one of the most important aspects of any ERP implementation. They work and engage with various project uh, work streams and whilst many of them still doing their day jobs as well. It was key for us to make sure that the test process was managed and was as smooth as possible for them. So we developed numerous support documentation, training sessions and communication channels focused on testing for our SMEs. And I'll just touch on two of those for now. So this image shows one of the many training support documents that we created and this one is a step-by-step -step guide on using the test module within Azure DevOps for our test subject matter experts. Now this is quite important considering that it was the first time interacting with any test management tool for most of the two degrees business. This image shows an artifact that we created collaboratively to agree our communication channels for testing. And this worked really well as we had a clearly defined approach to communication between the business, the integrator, and the testing teams. And it was especially important during acceptance testing phases, as well as proving valuable when we had to pivot to remote working during the lockdowns we experienced last year. And then going back to Tony's key requirement, cost of ownership, how cheap can we make it to support, and the requirement to deliver a regression automation pack as part of this project. So we kicked off a test automation stream. We acknowledged that we needed to wait until we achieved a level of maturity in both our understanding of the implementation and a level of code stability before we could kick off our automation, though even then, changes were required. So to accommodate the risk of change due to learnings as we progressed, we designed an approach to delivering the stream of work which we found highly successful. We set up a test automation squad of two, assigned a product owner who was a senior finance subject, subject matter expert, and we agreed to deliver iteratively over an 11 sprint period. After investigation and working with the test engineering manager, we, we agreed to adopt the Microsoft recommended test automation tool, which is RSAT. I won't go into detail on the whys and wherefores now, but feel free to reach out if you have any questions. So initially we, sent up, we set up a sprint zero, which, uh, which you can see identified in blue. This was three weeks in duration. And our objective for that sprint zero was to develop our plan automation framework, secure and set up our VMs, set up the RSAT client, prioritize our automation product backlog, and then se select the scope for sprint one. So a successful sprint zero was our trigger to enter into automation scripting. And then once we were successful in that, sorry, within each sprint, we developed automated end-to-end -end tests based on the sprint planning we conducted uh, demos at the end of each sprint to demonstrate working automated tests and communicate the plan for the next sprint. And this allowed for continuous feedback to be incorporated into the build and any project changes to be prioritized for automation that has already been built. We also included points in which we could pivot, pause, or suspend at agreed stages, depending on the state of maturity of the solution at that time. Remember, we we're still uncovering more requirements. So we actually, uh, those are identified by those red diamonds. So we actually did use our first uh, uh, suspend point, uh, and we knew by the time we get to sprint four, we would run out of tests to automate. So then we did suspend at that time, and we reassigned our test engineering resources to other streams of work until we were ready to reconvene in sprint five. In this instance, there was no delay because uh, we went and ran our sprints 10 and 11 over our regression testing. So some highlights 
on, on using this automation during our implementation before we could even get to, uh, to go live. So prior to go live, we tested a minor and a major update, which took less than a week to complete with one test engineer. In fact, the automated run goes for six hours versus a manual run, which will go for two weeks and four test resources. So it's a fantastic result, though I do recognize that it's over a course of a project which had been running for a test project, which had been running for almost 18 months at that time. So I don't necessarily expect the same pace as we move into BAU, but I do expect that we would meet the target that Tony has set, the two week, two resource target for any uh, releases that are tested after. We were also able to utilize this automation to validate a number of trial deployment runs as we, that we executed prior to go live, so our mock go lives. And typically during an activity for a deliverable of this size, we have a bunch of testers running around pulling together deployment smoke packs because the timeline is very minimal in the mock go live and frantically executing these tests. So in this instance, I'm glad to say things are quite calm. And as we mentioned earlier, when talking about resource management, we were able to re release people as planned, and in some instances, instances even earlier than planned. Thank you. Tony. Thanks, Shaka. So, um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, um, this is the kind of information I was looking for when I was planning out my program, or my test part of the program. And um, so I share it with you today, so hopefully it makes it easier for you to understand the kind of costs and allocations you'll be looking at. So test of, cost of testing was 17% um, of the overall program budget. The, of that 17%, 89% of that budget was on manual testing. Now that included business acceptance testing, migration testing, system test, system integration test. And the remaining 11% was on automation, which included the cost of uh, creating the automation, the execution of the automation against two updates, as well as the performance testing. In terms of the number of test cases created, we had 3,837 test cases. We only executed 36, uh, sorry, 3,667 but we did it more than once. So for example, in our migration uh, activity, we had around 220 test cases that we would have executed more than, 20, uh, more than six times. Defects created, 1,015. I didn't think that was too bad. In terms of the ratios, you can see the defect to test case ratio, 20 for system tests, which was good. Um, 40 was to be expected in integration, given the integration points, and all other testing, 26. In terms of test automation, we only automated 300, uh, sorry, 431 test cases with 21 integration uh, test automation cases. And as Shikar said, six hours to execute. And look, in my, in my mind, test automation was a stunning success. It's um, really su uh, supported us well in our first update, which we've just done two weeks. Three people, we did pause our testing between go live and uh, the end of program warranty. So we actually hadn't done any testing of the updates between March and now. So um, program warranty is just finished, as I mentioned, we'll transition to BAU. We've set up a continuous improvement value stream embedding the application into the organisation. We're looking to deliver in two week sprint cycles, new and refined functionality into the business. Test automation is going to be very helpful for that. Uh, overall, I expect to achieve our test automation ROI within the first six months of Go Live, partially through the program and partially through the uh, BAU activities. Um, and then I expect we'll be saving more than 200k per annum on the initial test support projections. Long term, once we mature the application, we no longer require a continuous improvement value stream. Uh, and the testing process is trusted by the business. I'll probably look to, uh, in my mind, that kind of testing becomes battery work and I'll probably look to offshore it. Um, in the meantime, we need to be vigilant in testing and, and the changes that are introduced into the application and the impact potentially on the automation uh, suite. So testing need to be a really strong advocate to making sure that we, you know, the impact isn't too much or the fact that they've got to pay for the maintenance to update that. Uh, in my view, in spite of the impacts of the Great Resignation, two COVID lockdowns, sickness, 
and all the rest that happened that year. Testing did a pretty fantastic job and it's a sentiment that was echoed by all in the programme and up to the exec level. So thank you.